Thank you, sir. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics, uh, the solar cycle evolution. And what I, I show you today is the recent decline we have seen in solar activity and some of the interesting things that we have learned uh, having the opportunity to observe the sun in a quieter state. Uh, some were surprises, some were discovery or rediscoveries that you will see uh, as I go along. Um, and one of the main message on my talk is that if you look at cycle 24, uh, it's certainly different from the recent cycle, but in an historical uh, uh, context, it really doesn't look as peculiar or strange as many people think. So what I'm showing uh, at the bottom is a plot of sunspot area as a function of time, going back to 8080, and I will talk quite a bit about sunspot area during the, uh, my talk, because this is the longest record that we have available of physical measure of activity uh, from the sun. There were some questions on the seminar on Wednesday. <coughs> some sort of area, sunspot area is a good indicator of magnetic flux, and I'll try to address that um, in the course of my talk. And this really depends by the question you are, you're trying to answer. So what you're seeing here is that um, starting at about uh, 1940, we have been in a period of very high activity above average. So most of the observing program of the sun from the ground and space we really uh, uh, started started during a period of uh, very uh, I've observed the very haptic sun. And cycle 24 is the first cycle when we see the sun uh, uh, in a weaker in a weaker cycle. And you need to go back about 100 years to find a cycle that was just as weak as that one. So if we take a closer look to the recent cycle, this is again sunspot area as a function of time. I'm plotting in blue the daily values, and in uh, um, in purple you see the uh, tree rotation average. This is millions of the solar hemisphere, so uh, sunspot area really covers a very small fraction of, of the sun. So I'm showing here an arbitrary line. Uh, and this is roughly uh, giving you an idea of what the level of uh, uh, the previous two uh, of the cycle 21 and 22 maxima were. So if we look at the number of days, we have a very large area which is above this uh, arbitrary line. You see that we have a lot of these days in cycle uh, 21 and 22, not that many in cycle 23. There is an interesting exception here with big spikes which correspond to the large active region that appeared on the sun in October. At uh, the end of October 2003, and these uh, were the sources of the Halloween storms. And when you go to cycle 24, you really find that there are only a handful of days uh, when activity uh, was showing a large uh, uh, sunspot area. Uh, so in a more quantitative way, uh, uh, an interesting thing to note is also, if you look at the number of days when sunspot area was really close to zero, uh, we have several of those days right at the maximum phase of cycle 24. So in a more quantitative sense, if we look at the, uh, the value of uh, sunspot area during maximum, we find that there is about a 27 degrees, 27 percent decrease uh, at, in cycle 23 compared to 21 and 22, and almost a 60 percent decrease for cycle 24. So we've seen a, a significant decline in activity, and especially uh, in, in the recent cycle. Now, we not only have sunspot area, for, for the total sunspot area variable, we also have data that tell us what the area and location of individual spots uh, is. So we can look at the distribution of fluxes of spots over the sun. And what I'm showing here are two curves showing the number of spot groups as a function of spot area. And this was a surprise to me when I first looked at this plot. There is absolutely no scaling factor here. And you find that uh, indeed the cycle 22 and 23 track each other. The distribution track each other very nicely. There are almost no difference in, in the two distribution until you get to the very end uh, uh, in the tail of the distribution, which correspond to this very large uh, uh, spark group. So what this is telling us is that the main difference between cycle 22 and 23 is in the number of this very large uh, 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 sunspot complex. And you may uh, say, well, does it really matter? I mean, these are only a, a few percent. And in fact, they correspond to about 2 or 3% of all spots that appear during a cycle. Uh, and this is certainly true, but this is a log-log plot. So there are not many of these large uh, complex uh, 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 of, uh, I mean, this, this large complex active region, but they account for about 20 to 30 percent of the total sense per area that emerges during a cycle. So these are very big players in terms of, uh, 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 of the cycle determining the strength of the cycle and also the, the polar field, as we'll see later. And these are also the longer-lived complex that uh, we see uh, on, uh, uh, on the sun. And another difference between cycle 22 and 23 is not just the number of this large active region, but the fact that most of this active region appeared 
uh, date in cycle 23, uh, predominantly in 2002-2003, so during the late maximum or declining phase of the cycle. Now, if we do the same kind of analysis for cycle 24, we find that uh, there is a dramatic change in the distribution. Uh, this is the slide blue shows the cycle 24, so we see a decrease of all, uh, uh, um, in all sizes of, of spots in cycle 24, and a very significant one. And just to give you an idea, when we talk about large complex, what they look like, this is, this is a large uh, uh, spot group, which is about 1,400 uh, um, millions of hemispheres. So these are very large groups that actually are visible uh, with naked eyes. Yes. Did you correct that by the portion of the cycle that's been observed? Yes, yes. So these, these uh, and you are very right. In the previous plot, I'm showing the entire cycle, comparing 22 and 23. And here, I'm comparing only the rising phase, the first 5.5 years. So I'm starting, uh, com for, for, for cycle 24, I'm starting in 2009. So I'm trying to be, to be consistent as much as possible. We're still in the maximum phase, so we can't really say anything conclusive until the cycle is. And now, if I multiply this curve by 1.5, I, I can match fairly well uh, the level uh, here, but I still uh, see a lack of large uh, spark groups in, uh, um, in, in cycle 24. So we really seen a, a large decline in activity. Now you can wonder, well, is this change in the distribution really something unusual? Is something strange going on in cycle 24? And uh, the answer is not really. I mean, if we look at the historical greenwich record, you find that indeed uh, weak cycles have fewer spots and especially have fewer of the larger spots. So what I'm showing here is the same kind of distribution analysis for cycle 19 and 12. Uh, 19 is the strongest cycle on record that we have observed. And cycle 12 is, a, is a, a very weak cycle. And in this case, I need to multiply by 2, not 1.5, to match these two curves. These here, but still, you see, I can't quite get to the level uh, of cycle 19 in the tail of the distribution. So one thing that is interesting to ask is what is this means for uh, irradiance. And if you look at the total solid irradiance record, you find very clearly uh, the signature of the lack of these large uh, spark groups in, in TSI. So this is showing the daily values in blue, and the red curves is the 81-day average. Uh, the, the large day-to-day -day variation is real. This is not noise in the data. And what you're seeing here, when the TSI decreases sharply, this dip corresponds to the passage of a very large spark group across uh, the central meridian. So, oh, so if you count the number of these the, the days when uh, TSI decreased significantly from the mean values, you find that there are more than 100 of these days in cycle 22, and only 66 in cycle uh, uh, 23. So the day-to-day -day variability uh, that we see in TSI is very clearly uh, showing this uh, change in the spot distribution that we've seen at the photosphere. However, if we look at the average curve, the two cycles don't look very different. And if you do an average of TSI during the three-year maximum in 89-91 and the three-year maximum in 2000-2002, what you're finding is that the value for TSI is remarkably similar, almost identical. Uh, so this was a surprise to me. And uh, the, the, the reason is uh, uh, when you look at total solar radiance, uh, sunspots are not the whole story, of course. I mean, when you look at the radiance, there are uh, uh, both uh, bright and dark when you picture on the sun. So if you really want to understand the changes that we see uh, in the radius data, we need to take into account both components. So what I'm showing here are two time series for sunspot area and particular area. And these are data taken from uh, San Fernando Observatory. Um, and you can see that the both show a decline in activity over the course of the last three cycles. And if you look just at the area, the sunspot area declined significantly more. This is very consistent with what I was showing you before, was no uh, sunspot record. Uh, and the area declined about 19%. Uh, so with the, so these are, uh, this is by Frank Gary Chapman. Uh, San Fernando Observatory is a small observatory run by uh, uh, the California State University of Northridge. And they have this longest record of, uh, measures uh, of sample impact that goes back to the uh, 1980s. Does that mean you have to be careful with experimental TSI? Yes, we do. Yeah, in fact, I mean, we really don't know at this point, uh, because we only have some sort of area when you go back in time. So this is one exactly the point we're making. 
and, and these programs, has, uh, there are similar programs now uh, running uh, at Mount Loa with, uh, with PSPT and high resolution data. So with my friend, Dora Kreminger, uh, we look at the faculty uh, in the same way we look at the spot and ask what are the, large, the, the structure that change the most during cycle 23. And it turns out that uh, uh, the, the change in the faculty was very similar to what we were seeing in, in the spot where the largest faculty uh, that decrease the most in cycle uh, 23. So you, uh, these are the kind of cycles that uh, uh, we found were fewer uh, uh, during the, uh, that cycle. And these appear the brightest when you look at the sun at relatively low resolution because of the high field factor. So, so this is important because when you look at uh, irradiance, not only sunspot area is not enough, but facular area is also not enough. You really want to account the changes in the magnetic field in terms of the brightness of this uh, individual uh, magnetic structure. And so what these indices show are the sunspot deficit and picular axis. And they are computed uh, going through an image of San Fernando, and they add every dark pixel with the observed contrast, the observed brightness. Uh, and, and, and this is what it is. And for facular, they do the same. They go through an image and they count every of the bright pixel with the observed contrast. And when you look at these two, you find that the changes are, are very similar. So both of these two proxy uh, changes have about uh, the same amount. So it looks like uh, uh, for cycle 23, the, the changes in the facular uh, contribution uh, uh, to irradiance and, and the, uh, the standard contribution to radiance were balancing each other. And, and this is probably why TSI didn't change very much. And this decline is continuing uh, in cycle 24, but it's much more, uh, more severe. So it's going to be interesting to see what's happened uh, at, the, at the maximum of this cycle. And my suspect is that uh, uh, the fainter feature in the network will play a very more important role for this cycle and determines variability. So we really need to know the magnetic flux and their contribution to irradiance for uh, uh, TSI and, and all the radians. Um, so, so far I've been stressing how the lack of large spots on the sun, but the fact that there are fewer large spots doesn't mean that the sun is not capable to produce strong magnetic field anymore. Uh, these are all uh, uh, data taken by Hinode SOT. These are high resolution images of spots, and I'm plotting them here because all of these spots at magnetic field of the order of 3,000 Gauss or more. So um, <clears throat> the sun still has uh, some strong field, and this is still a normal cycle. Uh, yes. Sorry. And, oh, yeah. The last one is November 19, 2004. Oh yes. Uh, sorry, it was 2013. This actually, <laughs> and in fact, this is this is the famous spot. This is a, this is one of the sorry. <laughs> this is 2013, and you probably remember this was uh, one of the surprising spots of the cycle. This was very simple magnetically, but very large, is extremely dark. And uh, I don't know exactly what the values for these spots is, but uh, uh, some people reported 4,000 Gauss or more for, for, for this. It's one of the largest uh, magnetic fields we observed uh, so far. So the sun is, uh, is uh, this is, a, is, this is a, a weak but normal cycle. And we are very far from mount minimum condition, as you, as you can see. However, a few years ago, when we were going through solar minimum, there were quite a bit of worries about what the sun was doing, if a new cycle would even have developed. Uh, this is a, a plot showing sunspot number as a function of time. Uh, and you can see the minimum here between cycle 23 and 24 being a, a, for a very different, very long minimum. Here I'm comparing the value of sunspot number for the previous three minima with the period from 2006 to and, uh, 2010. Uh, and you see already in 2006, the level of activity was very low, continued to decline in 2007. In 2008 and 9, in particular, were extremely quiet years. There was really not much going on on the sun. Uh, so these are um, images of the sun in August 2000, around August 2008 and August 2009. These were some of the longer stretch when the sun was uh, uh, without spots. Uh, and if you count how many spots were on the sun during those years, they were, uh, they were present on the sun less than 30 percent of the time. And in fact, uh, this is a movie. Uh, not a very interesting one <laughs> that goes through uh, about three months of data, and you see there is really not much happening on the sun uh, during those years. So this created a lot of uh, worry in our community, and is that unusual that the sun goes through this uh, very long and deep minima? And the question again is, uh, the answer again is not really. 
Uh, yes, we had a lot of days without spots in 2008 and 2009, but if you look at 1954, before cycle 19, we actually had uh, quite a few of those days as well. And if we go even uh, farther back in time, we find minima that were even longer uh, than the one we have recently observed. So what this plot shows here is sense per number on the top, and each of these uh, black uh, vertical lines correspond to a day without spots. So you can see the length of this uh, recent minimum compared to uh, the previous one, but when you go back, you find that this doesn't really look unusual or uh, peculiar in any, in any way. So nevertheless, there was a lot of discussion, uh, and still there is, about something peculiar going on in the sun and the possibility that the sun is entering a mandrel minimum phase. A lot of this was driven by uh, the observation taken at Cape Peak with the Magma Pierce Observatory. And in 2009, there was a, a very controversial paper coming out in Nielsen reporting uh, a decline in the sunspot magnetic field and a corresponding increase in the sunspot uh, uh, brightness. And uh, their conclusion was that something was uh, uh, really changing in the uh, physical property of spots. The spots were uh, vanishing from the sun. And so their uh, expectation was if this trend continued, there would be no spots uh, after 2015. This is not very likely at this point, but then they change uh, their, uh, their uh, prediction and, and saying the spot will disappear by 2022. 20, and this is a plot from a, one of the recent paper, and they're still uh, uh, suggesting that if this trend that they see in their data continues, a uh, spot will disappear pretty much uh, with the next uh, uh, solar cycle and will go into a grand minimum. So what I'm showing here is a uh, uh, spot brightness as a function of time, a magnetic field as a function of time. And you see there is a significant uh, uh, change uh, uh, during this uh, relatively short period of time. So a number of people, of course, look at these, uh, uh, these trend in other data sets. Uh, they've been using uh, uh, MDI, HMI, more recently people have looked at Inode uh, uh, as well. And, uh, and none of these studies really could confirm that such a trend in uh, uh, sunspot. Uh, was, was visible. And we did a similar analysis as well with the uh, San Fernando data. Of course, we don't have magnetic field, but we do have spot brightness, and the record goes back for a long time. So the first things we did was to plot uh, the uh, spot intensity as a function of spot area. If you do that for all spots, you find that there is a lot of scatter, but if you start averaging, you recover what is a, a well-known property of uh, the sunspot, uh, namely that the larger spots are darker. Uh, then there's one spot. There is nothing new here, but what is interesting is that you do that for cycle 22 and 23, and you see that there is really no significant change between these two curves for, uh, for the two cycles. So uh, we don't see a change in the properties of, of spots, uh, and uh, we have no indication that spots are getting dimmer. They seem to have the right uh, uh, um, intensity for, for a given area. So they cannot do that with the magmas data because they don't have a spot area. So what they have done uh, was to look at the intensity as a function of time. So we did exactly the same. And this time, we have a lot more data. Uh, we have 26,000 data points here that shows spot intensity as a function of time. And if we fit all this data, we really don't find any significant trend. It's almost impossible to distinguish this first order fit from uh, a constant, uh, uh, a straight line with a constant, uh, a constant intensity. So we, we find less than 3% change in sunspot intensity over time compared to, in the old 27 year uh, time period, compared to the reported 2% uh, change a year in the uh, Penn and, and Livingstone uh, data. So uh, if I go back to their, to their plot, uh, you can ask the question, is, is this trend real? Well, let me show you what the new data look like uh, for the uh, MEC math. This is what they look like. So uh, you can see that starting in about 2010, uh, there is really no trend in the measurements anymore. The trends seem to be gone. Uh, what is different uh, in the data after 2010 is that uh, at about the time they started to observe uh, uh, the spot in a very systematic way. So for every spot that was present on the sun, the magnetic field and the intensity was measured. Why the, uh, this, this record in the early years was not really meant to be a systematic survey of spots, and they only selected uh, some, uh, some target. And in fact, you notice that uh, the intensity of little points here is, is quite low, but this is re uh, during the maximum phase. So you would expect a lot more spots be present on the sun in 2000, 2002 than in 2010. And yet we have only a few measures. 
not only that, uh, this is the level of, uh, this level here is 1,500 Gauss. And this is the typical uh, magnetic field that we see in a small uh, pore on the sun. And we know that there were plenty of small pore and small spot on the sun back in 2000 and 2002, but there is no measure of, at all at this uh, magnetic field. So they clearly they were not observing the small fields. They are very, they are very much correlated. Yes, they are. So the darkest spots are also the one with the strongest field, and this is because uh, the field the inhibit convection and so makes the spots cooler and, and and darker in terms of irradiation. This is all visible. Well, these, these are the infrared. These are these are the infrared measure. But it's the same in the visible. They have been the same relationship of work, of work in the visual. So yes, uh, the self spot area, the brightness, and the, and the magnetic field, they are all very much correlated. So larger spot are the darkest and the strongest field. So what we think is going on is that there is a bias in the, uh, in the audience measurement toward the stronger field right here. So we did it. We uh, look at our. Uh, uh, record of intensity for the same period of time. This is all the data from San Fernando. Then we artificially remove some of the small spot early in the, uh, in the early years to simulate what they did. And this is what you get. So it's very easy to introduce a trend in the data if you don't include all the spots uh, uh, systematically over the, the period of time. And so the consensus now is that indeed this uh, reported change in spots is not a, a, a real change of the sun, but most likely an effect of the uh, uh, selection of, of, of the measure, of the, uh, of the spot when they were measured. So another, uh, another interesting thing I want to uh, own in, the, in, in cycle 20, uh, 23 and 24 was a symmetry between the north and the south. We had a very nice talk about that on, on Wednesday. And this was also one of the uh, observations that was uh, um, considered an, an indication of something strange going on in the sun and possibly a new mandor minimum coming uh, in the near future. So if you look at sunspot areas as a function of time again for the two hemisphere now, the north and the south, you see that uh, uh, while the times when the two hemispheres are out of phase are very common, starting in about 2006, the two hemispheres have been consistently out of phase. So uh, uh, most of the activity at the end of cycle 23 was in the south with very little happening in the north. And then the new cycle started to fill in the north and later in the south. So you can see here that the north reaches solar minimum condition in 2006. The south reaches solar minimum, minimum condition later. And then the north starts first and the south later. And if you look at the latitude of sunspot, you can get a good indication of what this uh, difference in, in time between uh, um, the two uh, hemisphere here. So, and you can see that the uh, spot in the north are much lower latitude than the one in the south, which again is an indication of a time lag. And it's about a time lag of, of, of two years. However, if you include, the, if you look at the area under these curves, uh, the north and the south has been about equally active at this point in time. So, so there is clearly a delay and there is a lag uh, in the south, but uh, so far we don't see significant changes. In the uh, in activity uh, overall, um, there was a question if sunspot area is a good indicator for this asymmetry in the north and south on Wednesday, and this is uh, the same plot for magnetic flux, and basically shows us the same the same picture. So yes, if we look at the asymmetry between the north and the south, uh, sunspot area is indeed a pretty good indicator for that, uh, uh, as and because we see the same changes in in magnetic flux. So it is something to worry about, the fact that the two hemispheres have been out of phase for so long. It's somehow an indication that uh, a mandro minimum is coming. Well, the argument is that, oh, sorry, I'm just showing so you now that um, the sun is very active both in the north and, uh, and the south at present. This is a September, a couple of days ago, image from a couple of days ago. So the argument about this, the, how th that this asymmetry was, was uh, strange or somehow uh, uh, indicating of something changing on the sun was that during the mandrel minimum, there was a large asymmetry between the north and the south. However, this asymmetry in the mandrel minimum is only seen at the end of the mandrel minimum. So this is a famous plot showing the butterfly from 1660s to 1719, when the sun was out, getting out of the uh, uh, mandrel minimum phase. And you can see activity starts earlier in the south, and it takes a few cycles before both hemispheres become active. We don't have a lot of observation before the mandrel minimum, 
But if we look at the solution we have available, there's been a lot of effort recently to recover uh, some of the observation. There is really no indication uh, from what you can, we can see of an asymmetry between the northern and the south hemisphere before the Mandra minimum Saturday. In particular, you see here this uh, uh, data point from, uh, uh, taken from the Velius uh, uh, maps uh, for the major drawing uh, in the uh, year bef just before the Mandra minimum. And you don't see a big difference between the north and the south. Now, we are very lucky at Hankar. We have uh, the, a copy of the Velius book in our library. And uh, it's very interesting to go over some of the uh, actually drawing uh, made by Velius in 1642 to 1644. Uh, uh, and you can see that uh, as we look at the period of right before uh, the beginning of the Mandra minimum, we find that there were uh, several uh, uh, sunspot uh, on the sun, some were quite large, and in fact, some were very large. This is a passage of a large spot group uh, uh, across uh, the solar disk. And also, it's quite interesting to see in these drawings that uh, in 1643, there are uh, indications of a new cycle starting in high latitude uh, in this drawing. You can see both uh, Pike shown, shown as he was showing the spots as, and also the Pike around it. So we really don't know very much about how the Mandra minimum started. It's still uh, something we really don't uh, understand. And I don't think we are in a position to make any prediction about the Mandra minimum uh, at this point. Um, if we look at the historical record, we find that we had small cycle before, and the sun didn't go into a Mandra minimum. So uh, uh, this is sunspot number, sunspot number going back in time. And you see there were period of low activity at the beginning of the 1900 and uh, beginning of the uh, 1800 and 1900. And we are now going to, since we are going to another period of low activity. Um, so to recap this uh, uh, first part of my talk, uh, um, the, the main point I want to make that, yes, we are uh, seeing a, a significant decline in the solar activity in recent here. Uh, but cycle 24 appeared to be a weak, uh, but in a normal cycle. Uh, there are fewer large spots in cycle 23. This weakening trend continues in cycle 24, which is giving us an indication of a weaker dynamo operating inside the sun. Strong magnetic fields are infrequent, but they're still present. We still have a large spot with strong uh, uh, magnetic field. And there is really no evidence for uh, uh, a, a physical uh, a change in the physical property of spots uh, at this point. So we, uh, we don't think sunspots are getting fainter. There are just fewer of them, which is uh, normal for a weak cycle. And this is why weak cycles are weak. So for the rest of my talk, I'd like to uh, switch to uh, a slightly different topic and show you the evolution of uh, the polar magnetic fields and how uh, uh, the changes that we are seeing in uh, solar activity at low latitudes actually affect the uh, global distribution of magnetic flux and how this weakening activity has uh, uh, affected the, uh, the flux balance on the sun. So this is a plot showing the uh, polar magnetic field. This is a, uh, a, the time evolution of the, uh, uh, the magnetic flux between 60 and 80 degrees from the uh, NSO observation, the observation at Key Peak. I'm, I'm using this uh, region here because above 80 degrees, the data become quite noisy, uh, and using that as a proxy for, uh, for the polar field. And you can see uh, several interesting things in this, in this plot. You see the polar field tend to be uh, uh, stronger uh, near minimum. Uh, uh, at around the time of maximum, they change polarity. And then they reform and change polarity again. So uh, the, the first, uh, uh, what, what is clear is that during the uh, last uh, cycle, the polar field were much weaker than they were uh, during the cycle before. In fact, we see a decrease of about 40% in uh, uh, the polar uh, magnetic field. And uh, uh, not only the, the polar field were weaker, but we found that there is a lot more peaks of polarity at high latitude uh, uh, during uh, 2006 to 1908 compared to 1996. And, and this is where we are right now. So uh, the, the north started to reverse earlier than, than the south, which is consistent with the fact that the cycle started first in the north and later in the south. And then there was almost a triple reversal. I mean, it went from negative to positive, almost down to negative again. And now it's, it's, it's turning to uh, uh, positive. While the, the change in the south has been, uh, late, has been more gradual and it occurred later, but it's been more consistent. Uh, this is a magnetic butterfly from, uh, again, NSO data. And, and it shows exactly what, what I was trying to 
show you before, there is, there is, you can see the uh, different polarity flux migrating toward the poles. And you have this uh, uh, event of positive polarity, and then there are some negative polarity flux going on, which make the north reversal quite complicated, while the reversal in the south has been uh, a lot more uh, uh, consistent in time. Now, this is, of course, if you look at the polar field at very low uh, resolution. In reality, if you look at the polar field in high resolution, you find that they're not region of weak field of about 10 uh, Gauss, but they're actually uh, formed by a uh, very small, uh, strong concentration of a magnetic field that have kilo Gauss uh, strength. The polar reversal uh, at the photosphere correspond to uh, uh, a very uh, typical uh, uh, series of eruption occurring in high longitude in the corona. So uh, starting in about 2011, we've seen a number of polar crown, uh, this dark uh, uh, polar region, which represent a neutral line near the pores. And we've seen a, a number of eruption going on, which have continued until 2013, which is an indication of the slowness of uh, reversal in, in, the, in the north. And the same thing happened in the, in the south, uh, especially in, during 2013. So we can ask the, uh, the question, uh, why the polar field were, were so weak uh, during the last cycle? What was the main cause for that? We still don't know. Uh, um, all the uh, dynamics that is happening in the, in the uh, high latitude on the sun. But uh, uh, there is a, a, a lot of observational evidence from the evolution of magnetic field. And uh, Gordon Peterson is the one that has shown that in a more quantitative way, to my knowledge, at this point, uh, about how the uh, polar field evolved and how these uh, changes are connected with the evolution of the magnetic field. Uh, a lower latitude. You see these plumes of uh, unipolar magnetic field. And <coughs> this, the, the flux in the, within these plumes is very highly correlated uh, with the changes that we see in the uh, high latitude polar field. And the flux in the plumes is very highly correlated with uh, uh, what uh, uh, Gordon calls the uh, poloid of active region flux, which is a measure of the flux that is in the active region latitude uh, weighted by uh, uh, the difference uh, the distance in, in latitude between the centroid of the positive and negative polarity, which is another way to say the amount of flux that emerges along latitude and the tilt of the active region really contribute uh, in large part to what we see in, in the polar field. And there may be unknown uh, sources of also polar field changes that we really don't know yet. So there's been a lot of work in terms of trying to explain why the polar field were weaker using a, a meridional flow changes argument. Uh, however, uh, a lot of the uh, recent observations are really giving us a very consistent picture that the changes in time of the meridional flow are mostly in the form of inflow towards active region. Uh, and they result in a, a meridional flow, which is meridional flow is a transport, uh, is, is, an, is a polar world uh, uh, um, large scale uh, motion that we see on the sun. And we believe it's responsible in large part for these uh, plumes of unipolar field being transported towards the poles. Uh, this meridional flow is effectively uh, uh, faster during solar minimum when activity is low, and it's lower solar maximum when activity is high. And uh, we have reason to believe that this is also happening for uh, a strong cycle and weak cycle. So in strong cycle, you would have uh, a weaker flow, and effectively you are less, uh, uh, you are transporting light flux over the poles. And in weak cycle, you are transporting more of flux over the poles. So in a way, the meridional flow acts as a uh, a, a balance uh, the strength of the cycle. So, so strong cycles are less efficient, yes? So cycle dependent on the flow speed is that a minimal flow minimal This is just looking at the, at the average profile. So because you have inflows, at the average profile of the meridional flow, you, have infl you really have a flow. So I actually have a slide, maybe I can. Yes, yes, no, it's with helio seismology. I actually have a slide if I can, let's see, can get out of here. I can probably show you some of that. Uh, let's see. I hope this will work. So if you look at the time and latitude variation of the meridional flow, these are our uh, average profile that shows the changes. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, this is latitude, and this is uh, the, the speed of the meridional flow. And this is uh, when you subtract. A, a, a mean profile. So you see there are these bumps uh, in the flow, uh, which uh, uh, correspond to these uh, uh, inflows towards active region. And this has been observed 
uh, during uh, several cycles. And they do change uh, with the location of the, of the active region. So this is a series of these profiles, longitudinally average for cycle 23. This is the same kind of profiles with uh, uh, from HMI in cycle 24. So what these mumps really do effectively is to, uh, um, to slow down the, 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 the polar world flows uh, when they're present, and so uh, near maximum. So this is, this is, in practice, they make the polarity, the, the polar world polarity transfer less efficient uh, during high activity. So there has been actually a lot of work about uh, the discussion of this and how this can affect the, uh, it's the cycle strength. So let me go back to my polar field. So, so meridional flow is acting probably in average just cycle uh, the same way. Uh, so it, I don't, we don't think, as, I don't think my personal opinion is not think the meridional flow was the main reason why the polar field were weak. And in fact, it should act to counterbalance the, the, the strength of the polar field. So the decrease in the active region is likely the main uh, reason why polar field tended to be weak during the cycle because we've seen a decrease in the uh, uh, in activity. Uh, we also think that the tilt of active region actually played a role. Here I'm showing, a, again, a butterfly diagram with this magnetic data from NSO, but not as most of before in the uh, plot of Gordon. And I overplotted here the, the location of the very large spark groups. And if you see, uh, in this cycle, these, these large spots were distributed throughout the cycle, and some of them appear quite early uh, during the cycle. But in the, in the last uh, cycle, they, they tend to be at the end of, uh, of the cycle. They appear quite late, in a lower latitude. So a lot of these active regions uh, likely had smaller tilts because lower latitude active region has smaller tilts, and probably they were not Im as important in terms of uh, um, producing flux that could uh, reverse the, the pores. So, and, and you see the weakness of the cycle right here compared to the previous two. So now if you look at the, at the balance of magnetic flux over the sun, uh, um, this is what it looks like. And what I'm doing here, I'm only looking at the large scale magnetic flux. So Matthias gave a very nice talk about uh, all the fl uh, magnetic flux that is in very small scales uh, about a week ago. Uh, none of this is accounted uh, here. This is based on low resolution uh, observation. So what I'm looking here is only at the large scale uh, magnetic structure. Uh, and in blue, I'm showing, these are data from Kid Peak again. I'm showing the total sign flux from 0 to 60 degrees. And this little green line here is a flux that is between 60 and 90 degrees. And if you make a ratio of these two, this is what it looks like. So uh, at solar minimum, uh, you find that a significant fraction of the magnetic flux in the sun is actually like a high latitude. This is, can be quite important. And what you see that in cycle 21 and 22 was about the same level, but is a much uh, smaller ratio here in, in, in cycle 23. So activity at the, uh, in, the, in cycle 22 was very low at solar minimum, but the polar field were also very low at solar minimum. So when you look at the balance between the high latitude and low latitude field, actually the high latitude field was weaker than during previous cycle. And these are the important implications for how the corona and the global uh, 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 magnetic field of the sun looks like in response to this magnetic configuration. So one of the things that uh, people uh, believed and you'll find in many uh, test book of the sun is that a solar minimum, the sun uh, takes a very simple magnetic configuration. They look very dipolar. Uh, this is uh, because the polar fields are stronger and they're dominating in terms of uh, the magnetic field. And this is eclipses showing exactly typical eclipse with a very dipolar simple corona streamer are, are uh, visible at low latitude and a typical solar maximum corona when you see streamer at low latitude. Well, now, these minimum things look uh, quite different. Uh, these are uh, observations from Mauna Loa Solar Observatory takes in between 2008 and 2009. So this is right during the, the period of time when activity at the sun was extremely low. We are in the deep minimum that I was showing you before uh, on the cycle. Let's see if I can play the movie. And you can see that as you go across the uh, year worth of observation, you don't really see the corona uh, assuming a very dipolar configuration at all uh, at any time uh, during this, uh, this year. So the corona look very different from the classical uh, solar corona at solar minimum uh, uh, this, uh, this cycle. 
And we can take a closer look at this, uh, looking at a, a wider uh, uh, field of view. Now I'm losing Lasco, so I'm going to about uh, six solar radii. Uh, this is for 1996. Uh, uh, these are taken a, a week apart, so showing the evolution of a solar rotation. Again, a fairly flat, very simple dipolar configuration. Uh, in February 2007, the sunspot number was about the same, so we are already dropping to a level of activity which is similar. And you have seen a much more complex corona. This is just August 2008. This corresponds to the very boring moving that I was showing you before. Corona doesn't look dipolar at all. And this is 2009. Uh, again, another period of extremely low. Uh, solar activity, and this is as simple as the corona looked uh, 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 the past, during the past minimum. As we moved from 2009 into 2010, activity started to pick up, and the corona went to a much more uh, uh, into a four sector structure, which corresponds to a, again the emergence of active region in the two uh, uh, later to bend in the north and the south. And these are just movies showing a very active corona during. Uh, 2013, uh, 2011, 2014, and this is a corona now. So very much a maximum uh, uh, corona, uh, which is what we expect in this time of the cycle. So what is a, a, a something unusual or something uh, that never happened before? Well, we can go to the historical eclipse record and, 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 and look at the, uh, 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 what the corona looked like uh, during previous minima. This is a uh, highly processed, nice, uh, eclipse image for modern times, and this is what the eclipse would look like in 1901. And this is a time when we had one of these long and deep minima similar uh, uh, to the uh, one in 2008-2009. Uh, so so the, the shape of the corona can actually change from minimum to minimum depending on what, not just the uh, global level of activity, but the organization of the flux on the sun is and how the ratio between the high latitude and, latitude and low latitude magnetic field is. And this is also as an influence in terms of uh, the distribution of corona holes on the sun. Uh, this is, a, uh, again, a fairly typical uh, uh, solar minimum corona in 1996, when you see two large polar corona holes in the northern and the south. And uh, in 2007, 2008, we uh, still had significantly large corona holes at low latitude uh, present on the sun. And in 2009, uh, is finally closed down, and we are left with a very small polar, polar field, a very small corona holes uh, uh, on, on the sun. And these are actually a significant implication for uh, the solar wind and, and the heliosphere in general. So uh, to be a little more quantitative, I'm showing you now maps of uh, polar corona holes. These are uh, maps of the sun uh, showing uh, the, the longitude and, and the latitude here. It takes 27 days to make one of these maps. You need to wait for the sun to rotate. And uh, the, the upper plots show the ultraviolet images, and the lower plot show the corona holes. And these are derived not just by this image, but actually combining a number of images and magnetograms to try to define the boundaries of corona holes. So in 1996, you have large corona holes that extend down to 50 degrees or lower. And not very much uh, uh, corona holes at low latitude at all. This is uh, uh, 2006 7. So you have much smaller polar corona hole in these large uh, and long lived low latitude holes at low latitude. 2008 still look uh, uh, similar to uh, 2007. And finally, in 2009, this low latitude corona hole closed down. Uh, and you start to see uh, some smaller and not very long lived corona hole forming at high latitude in the uh, with the appearance of the new cycle. So the implication for the solar wind uh, um, are significant. Uh, if you uh, uh, look at the solar wind in uh, uh, 1996, uh, this is what uh, it, it looks like. The average velocity was about 400 uh, uh, kilometers per second. In 2007, 2008, the average velocity wasn't very different. But you see that there is a, a, a very clear modulation uh, of the wind high speed stream due to these large corona holes in low latitude. So there is a lot more structures uh, uh, in the wind. And these things changed dramatically in 2009 with the close down of the low latitude corona holes. We are left with very weak polar field and small corona holes in the poles. And uh, not only the uh, velocity of the solar wind drops uh, to a very low level, we are losing the coherence and the, the structure of the high speed stream in the, in the wind. 
And this is also implication for uh, the uh, interplanetary magnetic field. Uh, you see that the, uh, not much was happening in terms of magnetic emergence at the sun in 2008, 2009, but the evolution of the large scale magnetic fields and the closing down of these corona holes actually correspond to a period where the interplanetary magnetic field continues to decline uh, uh, in 2008 and, and reaches the minimum at the end of 2009. So we're still seeing an effect and the changes in, in the interplanetary magnetic field, even if the sun is not changing uh, very much. Uh, so this, these were some of the uh, uh, finding and, 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 and in some cases surprises, some cases not real surprises that we've seen uh, uh, during the uh, past two decades. And I'm running hurry here. This is my last slide. So uh, cycle 24, uh, it's, it's not really uh, uh, so unusual. It looks very much like one of the cycles at the beginning of the 20th century, but the fact that the sun uh, is, uh, uh, is quite a doesn't mean that all space weather is gone. We still have, and we can, can have some, some uh, activity in space weather. So this is all I have to say for now. Mark? They, they see a, a, a record high uh, cosmic ray flux uh, in, in, the, uh, in the data, in the modern era data. I mean, making the connection with historical record is, is not that simple, of course. So how anomalous or how different this maximum is if when you look at the uh, um, the historical record is not is not so clear, but so, yes, it was very high. Can you play flags? It's a, it's a surprise in a sense that uh, if you go back to the record, uh, you you. You see that the level for the, the previous two minima were significantly higher, about 30% uh, higher than what we've seen in 2008, 2009. So this is indeed a very low uh, level of, of the magnetic field. There are some reconstruction of the interplanetary magnetic field going back in time that Lice Bulgar has done. And, and this value is not particularly uh, anomalous in a sense that it's, it's similar to what was seen a century ago. But again, these are reconstructions. So there are, of course, uh, question about how well they, they represent that. I mean, I think it's interesting that if you look at the uh, interplanetary magnetic field now, uh, the level actually never really went up very much, and it's not very different from what we had seen during a previous minimum. Uh, what I mean is, um, if you just look at within one sunspot, sunspot maximum, you see correlation between the sunspot number and the magnetic I don't have a plot for that. It's more complex than this. Yes, there is a general trend that you would see with the interplanetary magnetic field being higher, solar maximum, a lower, uh, a solar minimum. Uh, but it doesn't follow strictly the, the sunspot number. Sarah is a nice paper on that. I mean, sunspot number, I mean, as you see, I mean, here sunspot number is really not doing anything, not magnetic flux is doing anything. The sun is, there is very little evolution of magnetic flux on the sun, but the interplanetary field continues to decline. So the interplanetary field is the response of the open field uh, on the sun, and it tends to have a minimum later uh, than we see in, in the solar indices. But, but actually, there have been some questions. This is an interesting question. There have been some speculation of what the interplanetary magnetic field would look like if the sun were when, uh, in, in a, uh, a ground minimum uh, kind of, of scenario. And, and there are even some uh, people saying that maybe the interplanetary magnetic field in a mandra minimum would be stronger minimum. Than, uh, than a maximum, because a minimum is when you build uh, some uh, coherent, uh, large uh, polar field. And, and in a very weak cycle, a maximum, you may not have a lot of flux on the, on the sun. So uh, the, what, what we're seeing in the recent, what I'm trying to say is what we see in the, in the recent years correspond to what we're seeing during normal cycle and mostly above average cycle. But this relationship can change when you go to very different. Uh, condition on the sun. In, uh, in your
Yes, it's, it's very similar. I don't think I have a plot on that, but yes, there is a very similar effect for uh, for cycle uh, 24. So yes, you know, we're going from a very nice thing. See if I can. Oops. For some reason, I lost my. Oops. I don't think I can get out of here. Uh, I don't know what happened. I cannot really get to these. Um, no, I don't think this is showing it, unfortunately. I don't think I have a plot for that. No, I don't. But uh, this is the, this is a uh, minimum phase of uh, um, cycle 24. And you do have this tendency for active longitude and, uh, showing only one active longitude in the, in the minimum phase. And I don't have uh, uh, the, the progression of, uh, of the cycles. But then as the activity started in 2010 and 11, you would see exactly the same uh, increase in the active longitude that we have seen in the, in the cycle before. Can you show the one plot um, with the total cycle variation of the average of fields um, below 60 degrees? How does it compare with the independent field? Are they well, if you, I mean, it's hard to see. It's hard to see. I haven't really done the correlation, but it, and it's hard to see here. But if you, if you had to blow this, this zero to sixty, they kind of, you, you would see. I mean, this is. It, it would look very much like the polar field. Let me let me tell you. I mean, maybe I can go back to these. So this is what it would look like. Uh, it would look similar to, to this plot. So the, if you look at the high latitude field, you would, you would find that they peak a solar, max, a solar minimum and they're lower solar maximum, so when the polar reversal occurs. So they, it's, there is no really correlation with the. So the independent field is shifting more correlated with high latitude fields instead of No, the high latitude field don't correlate very well with, in the modern era, they don't correlate very well with the planetary magnetic field because. They represent basically the open flux at high latitude in the co polar corona holes. But the sources of the interplanetary magnetic fields are not just the polar corona holes. During most of the cycle, they are actually the low latitude corona holes. So, so there is not that, that correlation. So, so they are one component, a solar minimum, when, when they are dominant sources of, uh, uh, of the solar wind is, is coming from the edges of the polar corona holes, and then the, you find uh, that they, they, they have an influence of interplanetary magnetic field, but not necessarily during the ice phase of the cycle. So is that why that, I mean, so the, op the, the low latitude could almost often evolve after the active region, and so there could be a lag between when you have a sunspot pattern between the active Absolutely region, true. And then the formation of the low latitude kernels with a time lag, which then is the dominant solar maximum input to the solar wind? Yes, yes, there is, there is, of course. So, so all these things evolve on different time scale. Active region is in the form of a spot uh, lasts only uh, a few days to a, a week. Typically, uh, magnetic flux can survive on the sun for many rotation, and, and the evolution of corner holes is on a much longer time scale. So there is a there is. Oh no, it's a very complicated. It's, a, it's a terribly complicated. We have a lot of sources. I mean, and coronal holes are one of those sources. But the, there is solar wind coming from a smaller region. There are in CMEs and transient events. So it's really a very complex. A very, this is a, 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 a very. I mean, it's a simplification of, of what you see in, in terms of. Uh, I mean, large scale, or longer time scale. But uh, to predict the the interplanetary field is one of the big challenges <laughs> that we have for sure. This is a good question. This is actually quite, um, we don't really know uh, uh, all about the formation of, of cone holes that they really form. The polar holes uh, appear very clearly to be formed at the evolution of the high latitude flux. I mean, if you look at the, uh, let's see if I can get here. So if we look at the evolution of the magnetic field, um, you do find that the formation of this uh, uh, unipolar region in the high latitude is actually uh, very clearly the result of the evolution of the low latitude magnetic field. This is a dominant low source latitude. for that. The low latitude holes, it's, uh, uh, again, is, is, uh, I don't think we really know. I think some of the corona holes do form from the decay of active region. And uh, I have an example here. So at least some of the large corona holes are coming from decayed 
fact, this is the, what I was showing before to Mazumi, this is the active longitude, this is a persistent uh, uh, activity at the same longitude, this is, consists of several active regions emerging, rotation after rotation. And you see that at this active region decays, it forms two regions of uh, predominantly negative and positive polarity. And this region right here, uh, which is hard to see in, this, uh, uh, in the screen, but it's mostly negative, is where these large holes form. So uh, you can also see that there is not much where these plaques around it that can recon uh, reconnect with. So in some cases, the decay of this large active complex forms these large patches of unipolar field that doesn't really have anything to connect with and ends their life in the corona hole. But do all the corona hole form this way? I don't know. Some, some do, some do, for sure. There are coronal holes created from just the clients that are not, they aren't necessarily created from the same architecture. It's a very difficult question to answer because, again, yes, you're I just wanted to hear that, you know, it's not all from the I don't think we know. I don't think we know. I mean, what we know is some of the decay, uh, uh, decayed plaques from active region enter life in coronal holes. Uh, if the vice versa, if, if something has happened on the sun, I really don't know the answer for that. I don't think we can establish that from the observation we have right now. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much.